Hello, everyone. Welcome in. If you're just logging in, uh, you're welcome to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to let me know where you are listening from today. I'm here in Seattle. Tim and Kylie are in the UK. Where are you listening from? Hi, Terry. Terry's listening from Bainbridge Island. Welcome. I'm going to give this just um, another minute or two before we officially get started. Uh, but my name is Magna Gerardi. I am the event manager at Book Larder. We are a cookbook store in the heart of Fremont um, in Seattle. And um, we're continuing to run virtual events. And it's been really wonderful to uh, welcome folks from all over the world and all over the country into our small bookshop in Seattle. So thank you for joining us. Uh, hi, Karen. Karen is listening from Virginia. Oh, hi, Aran. Hello. Uh, Aran is listening from Seattle. Sherry's in Tupper Lake, New York. Ellie's in London. Joanne's listening from Vancouver, BC. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, today we are um, going to be talking about this really wonderful new book, The Modern Preserver's Kitchen by Kylie Newton. Um, it's a really wonderful book um, that takes a look at preserves, um, jams, chutneys, pickles, ferments, and um, really gives us a solid application for how to use those preserves um, in recipes after the fact. So really excited to hear more from Kylie and from Tim. Um, the book can be ordered at booklarder.com. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat for anyone that's interested in purchasing a copy. Um, you can support this author tech by purchasing a copy from us or from your favorite independent bookstore. Um, we will have some time for questions. If you have any, um, please do drop them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, that way uh, I'll be able to keep track of them a little bit better and we'll leave some time towards the end um, for questions, but feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A at any time during the event. Um, we are joined today by Kylie Newton. Um, Kylie grew up in New Zealand and lives in London. She has turned her hand to a variety of creative jobs from analog photography printing for artist Wolfgang Tillmans to floristry in jam jars. Uh, many years ago, she began making preserves to give as homemade Christmas presents, uh, which led her to create the London-based preserving company, Newton and Pot, making quality jams, pickles and chutneys in small batches was at its heart, uh, selling them at local markets uh, with clients as such as Selfridges, Harrods, and Harvey Nichols. She's seen as an expert in her field and now focuses her attention on hosting, preserving workshops, food writing, food consultation, and recipe development. Um, Kylie is going to be joined in conversation by Tim Hayward. Um, Tim Hayward is a writer, columnist, and broadcaster. He has published several books, including Food DIY and the best-selling Knife, The Cult, Craft, and Culture of the Cook's Knife, which has now been translated into eight languages. His most recent book, Loaf Story, is an extended love letter to his favorite food, bread. Tim lives in the UK's Cambridge, where he is a proprietor of Fitzbilly's, a hundred year old bakery, cafe, and local institution. Uh, we're so excited to uh, have Kylie and Tim join us today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to uh, speak to us and to speak to our, um, our guests. I'd love to welcome you both back on screen. Um, looking forward to being a little bit of a hey. fan on the wall. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Very lovely to see you. <laughs> and in in your kitchen too, your, your natural habitat. What a lovely thing to see. Well, there is a little story to that. We um so when the um when COVID hit uh, the world, the pandemic hit, um, my husband and I decided to head back to New Zealand for six months. We left in November, um, missing out that horrible December, January, February, which I hear, um, and in New Zealand, of course, at, not at the moment, but everything was like normal. So um, we kind of escaped for six months. And we've come back, um, 
and we've been back for four months since May and we've been house sitting. So this beautiful kitchen um, <laughs> is not my beautiful kitchen. I wish it was my beautiful kitchen, but yeah, we have just been pet sitting and house sitting since we've been back. And these these aren't my life. books. I, I have them wheeled in by specialists. It's, it's not a problem. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this sort of Kiwi background. I, yeah. I, it, I, oh God, you know what we Brits are like. I mean, I mean, my imagination, it's a sort of a, a wide, wild, open, colonial country. And, 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 and there's a kind of sort of... I imagine things being more rural and perhaps there being a, a bigger tradition of, of preservation. Am I right? Um, not particularly. I, I, to be honest, when I grew up, um, it wasn't like the kind of Eastern European where we were... Um, saving the seasons for another no, uh, for no, next yeah. because it is um, it has the same kind of climate as the UK so mm -hmm. uh, there was a, my preserving journey started from a book called um, the Emmons Cookery Book which uh, every New Zealander has and there's a lot of preserving in that and there are you know preservers out there but yeah I didn't grow up preserving as such it's something that I've kind of didn't grow up learning I've in my adulthood I've started to learn it so you know continuous continuous student and learning all the time so yeah it wasn't yeah. New Zealand where I kind of found this passion and uh for for the preserving technique and it does it does feel like we very much sort of lost it here I think sort of uh, UK being sort of first into the industrial revolution I think a lot of our preservation stuff went into factories and the idea yeah. of actually de dealing with with glut is not yeah. something we have in our in our bones anymore, which is a shame. Well, I think that things, you know, from mass production, everything started to go that way. And New Zealand is kind of like a a new world. We didn't get many imports coming in, like not mass um, importation. So we would just have to um, cook seasonally, and uh, you know what was around us at the time. So. Um, yeah, I think that those country countries such as Eastern European uh, and Japan and um, Korea, they're, they're the ones that have kind of held on to all this preservation and maybe America as well. I mean, I'd be interested to see what the, the um, chat room thinks about that. Mm. Yes, there's, that, that, there's, there's a bottling and canning thing there that, yeah, again, we, we, we Brits sort of sort of miss. Which is yeah, we don't do that as such. Um, yeah, it's really. I've had lots of kind of uh, interesting chats. There's a demi community which I'm part of, um, which a, a jam maker preserver um, up in Canada has started, um, and they talk a lot about this kind of canning process. Um, which here in the UK we just do something very very different. We don't yeah. go into the water process. Here, I, I didn't want to talk about the water process, but here I am talking about it. <laughs> well, no, I, I, sorry, I'll just, I'll just show you. This is, this is where I'm sitting, and I think the, the left-hand side of that down there is probably preserving and process. Uh, the, my, my problem is process is great. I can deal with all that. It's just what to do with it afterwards. And actually, what I really, as you can see, I've just been frantically labelling things. What I love about this is you've sort of stepped off from the simply the fashionable idea of preservation and 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 sort of pickling etc and you've gone into how to apply it so yeah my first book was all about um just preserving and i felt like um i i've always wanted how to to know how to apply it when i was doing my market store with newton and pot most of the time people would say to me okay well what do i do with it and people buy jam and they just use it on toast um they buy chutney and they just eat it with cheese so i wanted you know i've been working with lots of chefs and doing collaborations and just trying to learn um as much as i can to kind of incorporate it into meals um i've done some fun collaborations um I feel like that's where I can be creative with it, with the yeah. preserve, is, is trying to kind of think of other usage for it. Some of them are more traditional. Say if we're making something like um, Korean kimchi, then, um, you know, using it in something that's quite uh, simple, like uh, kimchi um, scrambled eggs or omelette. Um, you said you were a great fan of kimchi. What do you eat your kimchi with? Well, I, I, I see, I may be wrong. I'm, I think I'm still using it almost 
as a as a chutney, um, sort of yeah. applying it to other things that are kind of bland. Whereas I know uh, Korean people tend to eat it; it's almost as a side veg. With, every, with everything, I think, because most of the time they're eating, you know, a lot of variety of different foods and a lot of deep fried food as well, and it's good for the gut. So I think naturally they've gone to it to kind of break down some of that kind of fats that are going into their their diet. You, and I think you, one of the lovely things about this is that is that he said, indicating the book, um, is, is 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 this thing this thing about <laughs> this thing about balance. I mean, when you when you say that, there's a, there's enough. Kimchi's got that ability to cut through, yeah. and and it it balances really well with something like like fried food. And, I, and thinking about it now, that's exactly where I want it. You know, yeah. on fried chicken, I was like, oh, wonderful. Exactly. But like but so so go, going back to the the, the the simpler stuff. I mean, the, the the easiest and starting pickles are those kind of things that are very much the standard of of um, sort of most of Eastern Europe, for example, of of of, of, of salting to begin with. Yeah, so and I guess you're 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 raising the salinity and using the water to keep the bugs out. Out, Is that, yeah. That's, so, basically, that's basically it. Yeah, so um, I separate the book into kind of four sections. Um, the first section kind of being pickling. I, I tend to work with a vinegar brine pickle rather than um, a fermentation pickle because I then get to the fermentation um, stage. Uh, so sorry, but, but but just a second. So when you say vinegar brine, I, yeah. I think of brine as being a salt solution, and yes, vinegar but, is different. So, so vinegar they, how are you using that? So more like the kind of Eastern European, they'll use vinegar as their base, as the right. brine, okay. and they'll add um, salt, sugar, and um, uh, all your delicious spices that you want to mm. use to kind of preserve the fruit or vegetable. You'll see there's a lot of fruit. Um, vinegar brine pickles yeah. um, and that kind of acts as your food time capsule whereas um, I think people think of pickles as that the fermentation because fermentation also can uh, it kind of pickles your food so that, that sort of self pickles from its yeah. own acid inside doesn't it it creates that kind of environment under the salt water brine to kind of pickle itself, but it takes that there's more of a time process. Whereas um, the book talks about um, uh, creating this vinegar brine because you know vinegar is a, a ferment in itself, and it's yeah. creating mm -hmm. a safe environment for the vegetables to be at, to preserve for longevity. Um, as long as it's got about um, five percent, four percent acid in it, um, yeah. and, uh, and, then, and you have the salt as well, which and and salt, a little also. Bit of salt, not a lot of salt, and a little bit of sugar, just to kind of make it palatable. And there are two different types of vinegar brine picklings that people call. Uh, what chefs use, they um, call a quick pickle. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's got a high water content and a high sugar content because they're using the they're kind of creating a a vinegar brine um, that is palatable straight away, whereas um, a preserving pickle, uh, you're using less water, um, so you can have that preservation. Um, oh, do you know, I, I, I absolutely hadn't thought of that. So, yeah. if if I'm if I'm going to my, my, my granny's store cupboard, I would expect yeah. to take a tomato out and yeah. leave the brine. The liquid stays behind and it's not a necessarily a palatable thing to eat you're also talking about an another thing where you're actually you're balancing the brine like a chef would ba balance a broth or a soup almost yeah. because that's yeah. part of the service yeah it's part of the service there's two different yeah you know, what um one i would use for preservation for um keeping something for longevity and the quick pickle you cannot use for preservation because it's got far too much water and the ph levels in it uh, will be far too high for preservation so that's something you want to eat straight away and you put it in the fridge um, whereas when you're creating a ferment you're kind of creating this kind of environment under a salt water brine with your spices as well and that needs a little bit of time um, to kind of start to pickle itself and it can take depending on where you put your pickle and what country you live on how warm it is or cold it is it could take from four days to kind of four weeks to six weeks um, uh, and you use your palate to kind of decide whether it's at that kind of funky taste in this book the the um, the uh, ferments that I go through are very kind of basic 
ferments that you yeah. might have already brought or that you can buy in your um, at your local market or that easy they might already be in your home and in, in your condiment ghost town okay shall we talk about the condiment ghost town what is a condiment ghost town so oh. I coined this term the condiment ghost town which I uh, which is I, I guess how this book kind of started all those uh, you know I I like to waste as little as I can especially with my food sustainability so you know everybody has that problem where they have half open jars of condiments in in their fridge and I kind of you know this book was ideas of how to use up that kind of oh my god I thought that was my filthy little secret whenever, whenever I, sort of, I travel around the country doing <laughs> radio programs and things like that and people keep giving me jams and chutneys and then they have a glut and they, they make a load and they give and I, and I love it and the, the sec, first and second spoonful are fantastic but I do find myself having an annual clear out yeah because there's just there's so much you get so much and that's a, you know one of my problems is I'm always testing and always testing recipes of course, of course. and to be honest there's only so many ferments or chutneys or jams that I can give to my friends before they actually tell me to stop so um yeah I'm that girl I, th I think from from a sort of the, the writing point of view I think there's it's funny I was talking to a young writer online today I'm somebody I'm mentoring and we were talking about that moment when you see the idea and the book just falls out the back of it actually yeah. that's not true because every 10 of those nine of them they won't go fast past the pitch but but in a sense there's that thing about that's that's such a a terrific insight you've just yeah. got to say you just got to explain what that that ghost town means and suddenly i've got oh i can so see this this yeah. so makes sense to me and it's about it's not as much about preserving as it's about finding the place to put preserving back into people's lives in their kitchens exactly i, I did you know the book i feel like it's not this kind of um, hard push uh, it's a soft nudge on preserving it's more about how to use those things up you know you may not have made um, the jam that I suggest in the recipe but there's other suggestions for other um, jams that you have in your condiment ghost town so um, it's yeah. about using your imagination it's giving you it's when you open up your fridge and you see this um, this condiment ghost town in your fridge and you're like well how do I use these up it's it, it acts as that inspiration I'm hoping um, I, I, I think that's that's I think it's quite a clever book in that regard but you know no it, it, it massively is because the, the other thing is I, I my my ghastly secret is I, I hate recipes. Yes. If I write if I write recipes, I feel that people are going to follow them, and it's too prescriptive. So what what you've done that I love is you've got the art of writing a recipe as inspiration and guidance and trigger. Yeah. So you might yeah. not do this exactly the same. You ought to, and if you read it through properly from beginning to end, you'll understand precisely how to control it. But if yeah. you do it once, you next time you'll change something you'll tweak something but you'll understand yeah. why it's there guidance uh you know trying to guide people to be cooks um and i know not everybody's at that stage but i um the if you read the recipes you'll see that they are quite descriptive you know oh god um, yes yes um i love and nigel slater um but i feel sometimes reading his recipes i you know because i do cook i understand what he means like yeah caramelize an onion yet um you know some people not everybody knows that so yeah. I want to you know say you know brown the butter until it smells nutty and it goes you know a golden brown or um I want to give guidance to people when they're cooking but that, um, that's why I asked you about New Zealand at the beginning because yeah. there's something it feels like I mean, you're using a very, mo I mean, it's a, it's a brilliantly modern book. It's beautifully produced and it's, and it's got that lovely, I just, I, I'm just so, I'm just obsessed with cookbooks and I love the way that modern designers are doing them. These, these are great. This is the cutting edge of it, but it so feels like, designer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but some of them and yours in, in particular also feel like they're the front rank in a thousand year old oral tradition of passing things on from one to the other to the other. Yeah, exactly. it, it feels like you learned it at your granny's knee, I even know. though you didn't. <laughs> I learned it at my granny's knee, but I think 
I, you know, I did start cooking from a very young age. Um, really? I, uh, my mother was a single mother with three children and um, uh, we had to cook the family meal for, you know, once a week, me and my sister. As, as a kid? As a kid. So since I was about 11, I've been flicking through recipe books mm -hmm. and, um, and my mother was quite creative as a cook growing up, whereas, you know, other you know, friends at school would bring her, would be eating like, you know, three veg and meat for dinner. My mother would be making things like nasi goreng and crab linguine and just Whoa. on the cheaper version of it, but just exploring different kind of foods. And so I would flick through these books. Um, I have vivid memories of sitting on the kitchen floor trying to decide what I was going to make uh, for the family meal. Um, and then excited about going down to buy the groceries with mom and then preparing the meal for the family. Uh, my sisters can't remember this at all that we used, we used to do this. <laughs> They're just so, denying it. They're denying your perfection. Yeah. So it must have just sat with me as, as you know. It, it, um, it definitely, it, sh it shows in your writing because you, you have a very easygoing style. Oh, yeah. Kind of, very, it's, it's very easy. No, no, no it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like you have to, like, wrench it out. It's like, you know, you feel this, you love it, and you want to yeah. you want to pass it on. It has a little warmth to it in that sense, I think, Good. Good. I, I try and, like, put as many kind of dad jokes in as I can. <laughs> dad jokes are great. Won't hear a word against them. I try to give that kind of lightness to it unintimidating I feel like some cookery books can be really intimidating you know um the photographer for uh, for the modern preserver's kitchen was Laura Edwards um oh wow oh gosh no yeah. wonder yeah I've always, <laughs> yeah I always wanted to work with her so yeah. I was very very excited that um that I got the chance to and I said to her let's just um just go for it find your um you know and don't be afraid to do something odd or quirky and don't you know um just really find that kind of inner artist and go for it so i feel like there's a looseness to it. it's not too contrived um i uh, i want people to feel like it's approachable book i you know um I, you know, I, I love this i i also had an art college background i trained as a photographer and i i have the same thing um when, I, when i'm working on books i often get everybody to my house where I have studio space and we shoot it there and we cook and eat the food together. Um, oh and it's a, it's a, an amazing thing, but also I love what you've got there, that, that the, there's a, there's a coherent vision throughout it. Yeah. And you've quite clearly got yourself in there where, where yeah. they don't usually allow you talking about photography and design and things like that. That's lovely. Oh it's yeah. Got a good... Because, you know, I used to work for the photographer for so long. I have a strong aesthetic. So, yeah. you know, I don't think I'm an easy person to work with. <laughs> um, well, that's that's a bit of self knowledge. Well done. Um, because yeah, I the process I find uh, you know especially the editing process I find very very uh, challenging for me. Um, it, it it can be really tough, and you you've done photographic printing in the in the old oh. way, haven't you? Yes. So photographic printers are, are a world apart and they're very, very, very persnickety and very, very perfect in what they do. Gosh, yeah. you, you must be hell to work with. <laughs> I, I think that I'm not easy to work with, but, you know, the outcome is very beautiful. Oh, it's, it's, it's so worth it. It's, it's, this is such a sort of live topic of conversation amongst so many of us at the moment, because I think we've got a, I mean, I, I don't know, the last 18 months I've, I've, I've been doing BBC radio programs from home. Uh, I've been doing TV yeah. stuff that I've been sort of shooting myself. I spend more time than I can bear on Zoom. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, we, I've, if you, you feel like you're a content machine. You're yeah. generating stuff all the time. And actually, the feeling that, that the creation of the object, the physical object, it, it takes me right back to my first year at art college. When you know we had lecturers with with big beards and flowers in their hair, and and they were talking about you know it's the it's the thing you execute in the end, it's the object. And I think sometimes I don't trust books where you've got a great big picture of the extremely pretty person who wrote it on the front. Yeah. That's not good. And when you look at it and go, actually, I, I, I'm I'm loving the title, I'm loving the, but 
Jeez, look at that photograph. That's great. Yeah. I, I did have a very good editor when I was with uh, Penguin for a while. She was, okay. she was lovely, terribly, terribly posh. Okay. But she said, I don't think people understand deliciousness, you know. It's got to look and sound delicious, and that's all that matters. And it, it's true. Through everything yeah. else, it's got to be that. And But I... I, I do think as, as as the technologies move on, I do think the beautiful object. Really, you, know, you can you can you can get it on Kindle for half the price if that's what you want. You can find the recipes online, but the important thing is actually going to be the beauty of that thing in your hands. This, um, yeah, I, I'm very proud of this one. My first book um, felt to me like an estranged child when it came when it plonked itself into my. Really? But this yeah. one, I feel very at home, and I. I you know, the last book I wrote, um, The Modern Preserver, was written um, six years ago, or published six years ago. So I feel like this is kind of the the sequel to it. Um, yeah. And it's the better, it's the six years of knowledge that I've gained. And I, um, you're absolutely right. You, 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 I found with my first ones, I didn't have the control I wanted. Yeah. And I think... I think you, you've you've obviously moved on in that time as a writer and as a, as somebody who controls the production of the book, and 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 I I feel very much also that you've done it at precisely the time when the industry's gone. Actually, you know, if we if we just keep churning them out, it's not going to work. We've got to make them beautiful. Yeah. And sometimes when you suggest things that you know that may be a little bit expensive in production terms, or you want to take more time over something, they'll let you do it now because it's got to be perfect. Well, this is, this has been two years in production. It's been two years. No, it feels like it, a long time. It feels like a long labour of yeah. love. Well, um, but but the, your your focus is astonishing. That's that is superb. Because yeah. I, I know that if you know if it, it's a long time to stay on a project. And the pandemic did happen in a, a year and a half out of that. So, but it's so. but it's superbly coherent. I mean, you, it, it right the way through. It feels like a, it's so of a piece. It hangs beautifully together. So, oh, yeah. God, well done you. you know, the cover you see is a unbaked um, French pani tart, and you see yeah. the pickles, the pickled pears in the jar. I kind of want to show people. You know, it's not finished product I, I wanted people to see the process I, I think I'm a little obsessed with process it, it's natural for a photographic printer it's okay don't worry <laughs> <laughs> I understand I, well. I went to art school as well so come from, a, I come from an art background uh -huh. um, in New Zealand um, uh, I've been living in London for 20 years so I feel you know like in London, yeah. yeah. And I, I always joke I flew into Hackney Airport, so I've lived in Hackney <laughs> uh, for 20 years before it was cool. <laughs> well, well, I, we should probably explain to our uh, American oh, listeners yeah. how how utterly cool Hackney is. I, I actually I can't get a passport for Hackney. I'm not cool enough. Yeah. Uh, my, my my beard just doesn't isn't big enough. I I have far too few piercings and only the one tattoo. It it, it, don't, it could never happen. And you don't have. <laughs> a little, uh, you know, uh, design the dog. Yeah, it's very, it is very cool. Um, I love Hackney to bits, though. Um, I It has priced me out, but I, you know, most of the, there's some amazing restaurants. I, I feel very lucky yeah. to be here. I, I, I think that it, it's a and real, um, it's, a, it's a sort of cultural and technical, and it's a cutting edge melting pot, really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's the absolute home of everything good. Um, it was a great place to start my little business, Newton and Pot, um, which sadly I closed down a week before um, the lockdown happened in March uh, 2019, just mostly because of, you know, Brexit and um, prices going up. And um, yeah, I don't know if the rest of the world know at the moment that there's a petrol shortage or... Um, <laughs> Because people have been yeah yeah <laughs> it's not it's not brilliant here at the moment people not brilliant it really here at the moment it wasn't my choice um, yeah um, but yeah I couldn't keep Newton and Pot going it was just becoming too expensive because we were hand making everything in small yeah. um, pots you know uh, nine liter pots um, at getting out of the jam like maybe ten to twelve jars. Uh, and I was selling these things to think people like Harrods and Selfridges. I don't think they realized how small batch we were when people call themselves small batch. They're talking mm. about, you know, 
even a hundred jars being a small batch and they make them in these um, big jam Steam bags. kettles, yeah. But we were making them like you would at home. So it literally, you know, oh. I, the other day I was making some cookies to put jam, these, um, uh, a recipe in the book. And I, I, because all my stuff is in storage at the moment and all my jams are in storage, I um, went out and bought a supermarket jam and I put it in these cookies and then <laughs> just turned into syrup. And I was like, what? is going on and it's because you know the jams we were making were just more fruit and yes uh, more packed in hold together better and yeah. held together and whereas these jams that you buy at the supermarket are predominantly you know fruit flavored sugar I, it's an interesting thing I, mean, I, I do think the market is is going to be I mean obviously I'm, I write for the financial times so I've yes. spent a lot of time analyzing markets yes. and and I do think you probably did the right thing because I think the the days of Harrods being able to charge whatever they charge for a jar of jam, you know, may well be may well be numbered here. But equally, you've got a six months supply of food in a cupboard somewhere if we can't get any petrol for our cars and we all start eating each other. And and I notice in your in your uh, CV that you you you're now teaching and teaching people so teaching courses so, on how to do this. I do courses um, and I teach people. I haven't done any online ones at the moment. Um, I feel like I've just been incredibly busy being back mm. from New Zealand. Um, yeah, I want to, I, I did courses before um, I left uh, while I was still running Newton and Pot, just teaching people the process. Um, I have an evening course, which is just a couple of hours teaching people um, you know, they go home with a few pickles and um, a ferment. And then I have this intensive weekend course, which is a six hour um, day where people learn how to make jam and learn about all the nuances of making jam. There's, I think jam is the hardest of all of them. Oh God, yes, yes. People think, yeah. oh, my grandmother made it. How hard can it be? But there's all these little nuances to get a good yeah. set. Um, yeah. especially in today's world where we're using far less sugar content you know if you put um, enough sugar in a jam of course it's going to set but uh, today we are far more conscious about that so we work with this um, uh, chemical reaction that the pectin has to um, to which is a natural product that exists in all fruit and and some vegetables so Go ahead. Yeah, we go off into the process again, but um, I right. just think it's a harder um, nut to crack the whole jamming process. Uh, um, so I want to teach people those kind of little nuances. When uh, have you ever taught formally? Where well, you've, you've never taught art or anything along those lines? It's not a good uh, background. No, I've done many jobs from a DJ in Ho and Hoxton Square for three years. <laughs> I had a agency on Friday night. Um, <laughs> I've worked um, in events companies, uh, creating, um, doing draping and dressing of furniture and uh, curating events. I just um, think you're very good at it. I think you're an excellent teacher and it, it, you know, it comes across a very humane communicator. It's good. Humble my words, you know, uh, sometimes I can't get a sentence out. Sometimes my brain is going far too quick and I can't get a sentence out, so. I, I must. I, I must say that, that, that there will be a role for you as, as society collapses. Somewhere in this, I've, I've only recently moved into this this room. So somewhere in the books, I've got my grandma's jam recipe book. During the war, uh, the Women's Institute uh, had jam trucks, and they would travel around the country. They were supplied by the military, and it was yeah. a big truck with eight Women's Institute women in it, and a canning machine, and a gas ring, and some big boilers. And they moved around the country following the crops, making the jam, sealing oh. it into tins, which were then passed on to the jam ration. Um, and, and she she took it very seriously. Uh, it, it was a it was a, a, you know, it was a strategic effort to create jam from excess fruit in the UK during wartime. That's jam amazing. trucks, it's the way to go. Yeah, this is I what you'll be doing. When, it, when things get really bad, the army will come around and they'll give you a truck. If you have a tank, a jam tank. I love this idea. I really do. Right to this. I would do that. Hundred percent do that. Do you, do these trucks exist anymore? I'd love to see one. Are there photos? No, no, no. Of I think that the the Imperial War Museum has records of you know photographs of them. Yeah. Um, and and then it's just that's marvelous. It's it's a, like a little fold up factory in the back of a lorry, uh, and and they and they go to the fields and take the crop in. 
I'm it's fascinated by that. That's, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. So what, just tell me, what, what is your absolutely favorite, cleverest thing in the book to do with a pickle? Well, pickling fruit. I think not enough people are pickling fruit. So um, with a vinegar brine rather than a salt brine, we are yeah. using a um, vinegar base. Uh, so that's why I wanted that on the cover as well. Is yes. Mm -hmm. Today I've been making pickled pear um, matcha friands and uh, just adding, for me, you know, um, I really love adding pickles, not only to uh, pickled fruit to salads, mm. um, but also adding them to desserts because I have the type of palate that um, never wants to end my meal on a, on a you know, rich um, yeah. uh, note. I want to end it on a kind of clean, crisp, even sharp note. So um, I feel like adding pickled fruit to desserts gives you that kind of alternative that, you know, you might be craving. It, it is the, the strangest thing. I think culturally the Brits have been rubbish with sour yes. for generations. They're all about the sweet and it's... it's yeah, yeah, yeah buttery and lardy and and pastry based and, and and i think pickled fruit you're absolutely right that balancing which i think is it's got a there's a great deal of southeast asian around that which i love i think that's that's, that's a very a very good influence but also weirdly a couple of weeks ago some friends were here cooking and she sliced up a, a just a like a green sandwich pickle and put it into a salad with lettuce I'm like, what are you doing you mad you can't put pickles in a salad and it was absolutely eye-opening. Blew your mind, did it? Yes, yes. Yeah. And it, it it recontextualizes everything on the plate when it does it. Well, you're going to have so much fun with this book then, because oh god, yes. <laughs> so many fruit salads. Um, I'm a massive salad eater. You wouldn't well, you wouldn't guess by looking at my body shape, but <laughs> I love salads. And um, yeah, there's a lot of salads in there, um, and because you know. Um, preserving is seen around the world. Everyone has been preserving at some point. Uh, um, I cannot say that I'm invent reinventing the wheel because it, it is something that's been no. around for thousands and thousands of years because yeah. before refrigeration, this was the only means to eating um, food for some people in the winter months uh, mm -hmm. where there was no fresh produce. Yes. So they had to preserve everything to, mm. to be able to eat. Um, so there are recipes from around the world and, you know, uh, uh, or, or from influence from around the world, from where it might be, say, this sauerkraut recipe. So I've done some um, uh, sauerkraut and potato um, uh, knishes uh, and there's um, yeah. sauerkraut and mushroom pierogies, which are a Polish mm -hmm. yeah. um, cuisine which I just absolutely love my my um, husband's grandmother was Polish and um, uh, yeah we we really connected she really loved cooking and I wish that I had been in uh, the kitchen cooking with her a lot more but um, yes. unfortunately she passed recent uh, oh. a few days back um, yeah. but yeah there's just things from everywhere because you know that is, pre preserving is everywhere in different parts of the world but sauerkraut is exactly the same fermentation process as, um, say, kimchi. However, yeah. it comes from a different side of the world. So there's different vegetables used, um, different cabbages and different spice influences. So, um, yeah, they say that uh, sauerkraut orig originated actually in China, yes. uh, which is quite interesting. But the Germans obviously really liked it and called it sauerkraut, which means sour cabbage. Sour cabbage. How, how, how do you feel about the, 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 the issues of sort of a gut biome and fermentation? Um, so it's good for you. <laughs> do it. I, <laughs> why not? And um, I, you know, I, I'm, I don't geek out so much in the whole um, health benefits of... Uh, so it's so refreshing, honestly. Oh, really? <laughs> well, yes, ninety percent of the books I find on pickling are telling me it's going to, you know, cure my amputated yeah. leg or something. No, it's not. It's just beautiful. <laughs> you know, I just feel like um, 
I, I feel like it shouldn't be this hard push. I feel like these are things that you should be trying to eat and incorporate in your it, easy, uh, the easy, humble res, uh, recipes. I don't feel like I'm, you know, very making much. anything yeah. that's too difficult. I'm creating, I, I, you know, I think I make very humble food. Um, so yeah, eat, um, you know, anything that, uh, that you're cooking with um, ferment, uh, ferments, if you heat it up over say 65, um, degrees what you've got is you're burning off all that good gut um bacteria anyway because bacteria yes, don't yes it's very much a, a, it has to be kept cool doesn't it really it has to be kept cool so i do do things like add you know um i've got a celeriac soup um where you know in those kind of aut autumnal months you want something nice and warm and starting to get colder so you want to kind of that um to feel that comfort but putting something sour on top too, like your uh, red cabbage and beetroot sauerkraut and a bit of sour cream, just to get that good kind of um, stuff, you know, But, uh, but I, 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 I do love that. I see it as quite a, quite a uh, I suppose I see it in visual terms. It's quite a theme in many of the recipes, this thing of something that's lovely and fundamentally quite bland, but yeah. then has a thing it's like the canvas on which you can splash the thing. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's the background on which you can you can dodge forward your image. And, 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 celeriac soup's fantastic. It, it's it's got a lovely, deep, bassy, woody thing to it. Yeah, but it's a, a backdrop. Apple in there as well, a, bit, a little bit of sweetness. There's still a little bit of crunch in your sauerkraut because, and you're getting that kind of sour notes through. So you're getting that whole, yeah, it's all always about layers, but the, isn't it? But the, the same with the pierogi, which is which is a, a lovely, fulfilling thing, but it's a big old peasanty mouthful of, of spud and dough, which is great. And it needs a, a, I love I, it. Yeah, I really do. But I, I'm so impressed by that, that particularly that tradition across Central and Northern Europe of yeah. those filling foods you need to get you through the winter. Yeah. So you, you, like, by, by around February, you've got nothing left but the beets, the potatoes, the fat, the flour. And it's the stuff you have in the jars that makes that not that just palatable, it makes it delicious. It's an astonishing it's extra it's level. It's going to heighten the meal. And, you know, you'll be surprised if you are um, new to fermentation just having you know a sauerkraut in the fridge you, mm. you can have one on the go because it's going to take a couple of weeks few weeks to kind of ferment have one in the fridge and just rotate them each you know it's only an hour or two hours out of your life making one up and then mm. just watching it and and keeping an eye on it have one in the fridge one on the go swap them over um so you've always got sauerkraut um, on the go you know once you make sauerkraut you will never buy it again you'll never have I, there's something i sort of detect in this as well it's something i've been doing myself as i've learned more about other people's food cultures i find myself drifting towards this slightly japanese chinese asian feel of a meal should have some rice a little bit of protein maybe yeah. Some miso would be lovely. And then yeah. there needs to be the thing that goes in. And that's the kind of, it's almost like it's the standard Japanese meal, isn't it? It's it's the handful of rice, small piece of protein, but you've got to have the pickle, otherwise that just doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't have a context not, without not, it. Not the whole story, is it? <laughs> no, not precisely that. And it's it's one of I the notes. But food. I love Japanese food so much. There's a massive um, Japanese uh, community in New Zealand and I grew up with a lot of Japanese food. A lot of, um, you know, I, I feel like New Zealand's quite um, cosmopolitan, it's quite multiple. Very much, yeah. I yeah. feel like I've grown up with a lot of variety of food, you know. I was introducing my husband to lapses 10 years ago because he had never heard but, of... Cl closer to Southeast Asia than to Europe. Yeah, in exactly. many senses so you've got the pacific rim feel to it yeah, and so i think I this think comes out very much in your in your style there's also yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of that kind of influence in it of, of me but but also I, I i just love the a lot of people use a musical metaphor when they talk about food and flavors and god knows in, in my job i've got to i've got i've got to do 800 words tonight explain, explain <laughs> describing somebody's food before bed and you often fall into musical metaphors but for me yeah. it's always that visual thing of You've got to have background. You've got to have highlights, yeah. and you've got to have your two hundred and fifty-six tones in between. Your, 
come from your zone system backgrounds it, it is yeah. it's more, it's more <laughs> of kind of um yeah it's a visual food is yeah visually plays with me and pickles are sharp detail they really are they're they're right up there in the front and it's yeah. the bit you remember when you go home <laughs> oh hi hello hey kylie <laughs> I'm just getting hungry and I'm I'm getting ready to want to go pickle something myself. <laughs> Here you both talk. Um, we've got some questions um, from some of our audience members. Um, Sherry asks, uh, can you describe the range of recipes that appear in your cookbook and maybe what a few of your favorites are? Okay, so um, yeah, as I said, there's so many from different places around the world because, you know, I, I, I feel like preserving is all around the world. There's a really heavy sweet section because, you know, the um, publishers quite wanted, wanted to do jam. I had to really push for some of the savory things through. Um, but it's adding kind of like, uh, there's lots, um, I guess my favorite one is the um, PAV. Uh, pavlova should I say um, and I call it New Zealand pavlova and I'm not claiming that New Zealand I'm not going into the war of claiming that New Zealanders created the uh, pav which they did but um, it's more to do with this is the New Zealand pav that I grew up with kind of, uh, I like to add um, like marmalades on top and uh, uh, dehydrated fruits and uh, instead of going to like um, uh, say just fruit you, we grew up with having um, strawberries and uh, passion fruit uh, and just a greater bit of chocolate on top growing up but yeah I wanted to do uh, um, something that was close to my heart there's also the I think it's the New Zealand ones that I really love most <laughs> also a New Zealand um, kiwi burger which is this yeah. So a good chef friend here of mine, Chris Leach, um, uh, part, um, passed on his uh, bun recipe for me. So these are milk buns that you can make from scratch. So there's a great section at the back. I, I feel like the book is like a twister plot almost where you haven't got the full story because, you know, you need pickles from this page or you need the, um, the bun from this page or you need this from this page. So it feels to me, I really wanted them to have lots of um, uh, bookmarks, but they yeah. wouldn't let <laughs> uh, Because I wanted them to be able to reference things backwards and forwards to get the full story. Yeah. Um, so this has got a, a pickled beetroot and an egg in it. Now my husband is English and when I first suggested this for him he was uh, quite taken back and thought that he wouldn't like it but once he tried it he was uh, sold. So uh, there's also yeah a, a back section in there um, where it is all those kind of home and making things from scratch just to try and make your food more sustainable. So, you know, there's um, tacos from uh, Mexican tacos in there and it's uh, in the back, it shows you how to make corn tortillas. Um, there's crumpets and muffins. There's my nan's um, scones, which is a very special recipe for me as well, because um, unfortunately my nan had 20, well, fortunately, she had 24 grandchildren, but unfortunately, that didn't give us a lot of, you know, hands-on time in the um, kitchen making the scones. They might not be the best scone recipe in the world, but it's the best scone recipe to me. So I love that recipe, especially because my auntie Cher um, was the one who passed it down to me um, because my mother is a really bad baker. <laughs> um, she's a great cook, but an awful baker. Um, can, I, can I direct you for a second to page 96? Oh, yeah. You've I, am got a I am deeply fascinated by this. Talk about mad variety of recipes. Yes. Grilled, grilled kippers with brown butter, I can go with. That makes sense. An egg with it, very, very good. Gooseberry chutney, dear so God, good. woman, have you run mad? <laughs> have, you tried this? have you tried this? You're no, have but I've got to. You've it's... got to try it. That is just, it's just superb. Those, yeah, the, here, look at this, mine too. I, it's just, <laughs> that is so counterintuitive for a Brit. Proper, decent Scottish smoked breakfast fish. And you put 
jam on it. <laughs> but but it, that I think it's it, layers again. We were talking about exactly, and and I and I, I I joke about it rudely, but 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 the truth is that's that's the spirit that goes right the way through it. Either you know, that, something that's blackberry, blackberry chutney is really good with it. Yes. As well. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Seasonal for now. There's just so many. There's Indian um, dal recipe in here um, because I find that, um, you know, chutney for me is the hardest to match things with, um, especially, you know, when I, uh, the, the chutney that I make, um, I went to uh, India um, about five years ago uh, with CNN, um, doing an ad for discovering, um, you know, chutney, the origins of chutney. Mm. The chutney that they make there is very, very different from the anglicized chutney that we make yes. here. It's more here, it's more like what maybe the Americans would call a relish or mm. um, it's vinegars and sugars and um, sweetness all rendered down um, almost like a sauce, but a, a chunky sauce. Yes. Yes. Whereas in India, it's fresher, it's made on the day, it's not a um, preserved, they um, adding all these kind of spices and herbs like you would, but I feel like the chutney that, you know, I is in the book is that more anglicized um, version. Very so much. There's New Zealand corn fritters. I'm, I'm pulling out all the New Zealand uh, just to... <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I grew up with corn fritters uh, at you, every kind of cafe that you would go to would have yes. corn fritters and a poached egg on top um, with chutney on the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, yeah, m my husband would never eat, uh, didn't know you could put chutney with your eggs, but now he's sold every time he has to have a bit of chutney with his eggs. Thank so, God, you have an Englishman making you more reserved. <laughs> Honestly, chutney with eggs. Good heavens. <laughs> there are recipes from around the world as we, as we um, and, and purely because, you know, preserving is this global thing. And I want yeah. to celebrate all of that. And I want to recognize all of that and, um, and be sensitive to all of that as well. Hopefully, hopefully I'm being sensitive. <laughs> Um, so Tina asks, we were, so we were looking just now at a few of your recipes that have a gooseberry chutney. Um, can you tell us, is there a substitute for gooseberries since it's not so common in the U.S.? So you would um, was it, gooseberries were, um, illegal, weren't they, in America, I heard. Oh, wow, that's good. But recently they have just started to come out. You get green gauges or plums. I think that could be that kind of nice, sharp. Um, Definitely sharp go sour plum, couldn't you? Yeah. yeah sour plum. Um, I would go down that route if you can't get gooseberries. I know um, from the Demi community that I'm a part of that gooseberries have been problematic in, in the US. But, yeah. or, you know, um, alternatively a uh, blackberry because it's that kind of bitter sweetness as well anything in that kind of bitter sweet time um gooseberries are great full of um pectin so they make a great substitute to kind of uh, especially if you're making jam with something that's low in pectin say like a strawberry they're a great mix just to kind of balance out and get a good set so um they're, yeah they're what about chutney. most they're one of our most useful native fruits, I think, because they're also, it's a really grown up flavor. There's quite yeah. a lot of sour in it. And yeah. you've really, you know, it makes your mouth go, go tight. But I think weirdly, a lot of the stuff you're doing with pickling of sweeter fruit, it's, it's almost like you're, you're, you're creating gooseberry by doing yeah. it. You exactly. know, if you actually took a, like a scuppernong of a, a wild grape or something like that, yeah. and actually I, did it with something sour, you'd get close to a gooseberry. Yes, you could that a sour grape would be a good idea as yeah. well yeah. um actually i like those um sharp tart uh yes. tone in my palette uh yeah. it's things that i crave more than the sweeter kind of tones or um oh, yeah. ru ru rhubarb gets me every time i love it, it that's that's the other sort of w w weirdly yeah. brit thing yeah Bob's that one that you can do sweet or sour as yeah. well. So rhubarb yeah. with mackerel or um, as, a, as a classic or kippers. Maybe rhubarb chutney with, with your kippers. <laughs> 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 
Uh, we've got one more question um also from tina uh, we talked a little bit about um the economic ghost town can you give us some different uh, tina asks please give us examples of different types of ghost town applications um so if you jam you've got <laughs> so most of the time what um tina what do you what do you have in your ghost town what and maybe i can <laughs> <laughs> it depends what you've got if you've got jam i really love you know there's a recipe for homemade ice cream run a bit of jam through your ice cream and making your ice cream even just drizzle it on the top of your ice cream yeah, crumbles. instead of adding sugar to the fruit for a crumble i add jam instead mm -hmm. um crumbles big in the u.s or is that a real english yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a chocolate brownie. I've just made my chocolate brownie recipe. Um, put you can run jam swirls through jam through your chocolate brownie and a little bit of peanut butter as well. Um, but if, so, if one ever needs an excuse for a grilled cheese sandwich, a grilled cheese yeah. sandwich with any chutney is is well, it, it creates that what you were talking about before the um, the sort of slightly bland, slightly fried, slightly goopy base that you need yeah. for a chutney to really punch through. I, I, I found a jar of um, Indian lime chutney upstairs a couple of days ago, and uh, that just made a toasted sandwich that I would strangle my own mother for. Yeah. <laughs> With a cheese mount sandwich, can you? Yeah, I, yeah it's, absolutely. It is literally what, you know, dreams are made out of. <laughs> <laughs> Melt some cheese, use chutney, it's fine. <laughs> using you know using the the sweetness or the tartness of a jam or a chutney or a pickle to sort of oh. be the be the sour tangy yes. element where you would normally use like a lime or you know something yeah. something else yeah. to cut through the fat um love exactly. it. and even you know if you've got pickle brines left over um, I suggest in the back of the book, and there's this fun section, which is one of my favorite sections, which is this um, extra section, uh, recipes to make from scratch. You know, you make your own, if you've got any pickle brine left over, make up a mayonnaise and put, instead of the vinegar element, add your pickle brine. Mm -hmm. um, make up your dressings with the leftover pickle brine as well. You just, yes. you know, make it all, um, you know, head, uh, head, nose to tail or, you know, root to shoot, use everything, use it all up. My, 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 my absolutely favorite winter secret ingredient is the, uh, is the pickling vinegar from pickled walnuts. Because it has that lovely sort of, uh, that sharp edge to it, but also the kind of dry mouth puckering thing to it. Yeah, I, I keep a little squirter of that in my mise en place. That goes into a lot of sauces and, uh, and gravies. What was that, Tim? Sorry, you, that, you that's that's the the, the, the pickling fluid from pickled walnuts. Oh, excellent, excellent. That's yeah. really drying astringent, which is not a not a flavour you often find. Yeah, I always, you know, when I'm making a pickling brine too, I always taste them, um, and and they're going to be sharp to your palate to begin with because it's usually you need to pickle something for a good um, three weeks before it mellows and the flavours start to kind of marriage and settle down. Um, but I, yeah, I still want, I, I still want to taste it just to see where it's going to go or see where it starts off to see where it's going to go to. Yeah. Are there any more questions? I think that's all the, that's all the questions that we had and uh, we are coming up on our time here. Um, it is wine o'clock. <laughs> it's one o'clock here. <laughs> wine Have some wine anyway. It's a professional <laughs> thing to do. Very professional. <laughs> um, Kylie, Tim, it was such a pleasure to have you both here in the virtual book larder space. Um, and such a pleasure just to, you know, start thinking about what I'm going to pick up and <laughs> ferment this uh, fall and this winter. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and on behalf of Book Larder, thank you. Uh, we hope to see you both um, in Seattle when it's safe. Yes, I would love oh, wait. to. Yeah, it's so lovely to meet you at last term. Thank you for joining. Thank you for talking. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we will again. I'll come up to Cambridge. Oh, and... yeah. I'll see you soon. Yeah. <laughs> for, sure. for anyone who is interested, uh, we will have a recording of this event posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. So stay tuned for that. Um, you will get a link 
uh, via your, um, your Zoom registration for the link to that. So thanks again to all of our audience members. Thank you, Kylie and Tim. Uh, Thank you. Happy, Good happy wine o'clock. Enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.